All right. How about we go on an adventure? Hello. How is everybody today? Um, I hope that you are having a good midweek. Uh, oh, yeah. I put spoopy music on for the intro, but it's, I'm probably not going to stick with the spoopy music because um, it will distract me. Uh, <laughs> let me just change that to, whoops. Well, you know, almost. Let me just change that. Um, okay, we're going jazz. Uh, but hi, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to Archival Adventures, the once weekly show where I share things from Special Collections and University Archives at Virginia Tech. And uh, let's see, I see a Pretty Witchery. I see a Matt M33. I see, of course, our beloved stream, our Siri bot that helps to keep our chat safe. Um, and I am Poglum. Hello from Worklerk land. I, I did hear some of our sort of regular crew will not be able to make it today, which is totally fine. Um, sorry, my brain just paused for a second. Um, I also, I've been, I've been futzing with the lighting. Oh gosh, that is so much better. Um, why didn't it do that before? Sorry. <laughs> All I had to do was turn off the auto white balance on the camera and then it was much better, but it wasn't doing that before I went live. Anyway, uh, today we are trying a brand new thing, uh, which is combined chats. Um, so whichever channel you are watching on today, whether you are on twitch.tv slash VTUL studios, which is the Virginia Tech University Libraries channel, or twitch.tv slash Rogan27, which is my personal channel, all of the chats that happen will appear in both channels. So, um, yay. <laughs> that should simplify a little bit. Uh, it's one step closer to full consolidation. Um, I just have to figure out how to add YouTube to it, which can be done when I have time to figure it out. Anyway, um, welcome everybody. Uh, today is the last Wednesday of September. And um, as we've been doing all year, the last Wednesday is items from the Heron Speculative Fiction Collection. And starting last month, we decided to look at the stories that were deemed classics in the year 1940 by Sam Moskowitz, who was a, um, historian, author, and anthologist of, of speculative fiction. So <laughs> we'll be looking at the second one of those today. It's uh, title is Colossus. It was published in 1934, uh, and the author is Donald Wandre. Um, just in case there's anybody watching who happens to be in the Blacksburg area near the main campus of Virginia Tech, um, you'll see here there is a launch party today from 4 to 6 p.m. over in the Squires building uh, to celebrate the new library collection. Um, held by the Pride Center over there. Uh, so if you're in the area and you want to drop by there and support them in launching their brand new uh, library collection, I thought I would throw that up there and, and just give them a little mention there. Uh, because on this show, we're looking at history. And when we're looking at history, we like to pay attention to the history of the institution that I'm presently at, the one that owns the materials we're going to look at. So, um, you know, they have a lovely, uh, lengthy land acknowledgement and labor recognition that can be seen in its entirety there. I have the shorter version above. Both versions are approved. Um, just 
throw that in the chat there. Um, so uh, Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tutelo and Monacan people's homeland, and we recognize their continued relationships with their lands and waterways. We further acknowledge that the Morrill Land Grant College Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of Native nations from their lands in California and other areas in the West. Virginia Tech acknowledges that its Blacksburg campus sits partly on land that was previously the site of the Smithfield and Solitude Plantations, owned by members of the Preston family. Between the 1770s and the 1860s, the Prestons and other local white families that owned parcels of what became Virginia Tech also owned hundreds of enslaved people. Enslaved Black people generated resources that financed Virginia Tech's predecessor institution, the Preston and Olin Institute, and they also worked on the construction of its building. Uh, so we just like to make sure that we remember the history of this institution before we go diving into any other of the sometimes problematic history <laughs> items that we look at. Indeed, hi, Hannah. Uh, hello from your work lurk. Um, dual chat is a thing. I'm really happy about it. Um, that is just like a new feature added onto the invite guests thing. Um, the the co-star, I don't, the stream together, whatever it's called now by Twitch. Um, you can mix your chat together and the mods can mod anything from either chat. So, um, so, so much easier. It's something I have to turn on um, at the beginning of stream and I have to wait for both channels to fully register as live before I can turn it on. Uh, so there's a few like minutes during the initial start of the stream where they're separate, um, but it's actually, it was super easy to turn on and seems like it's working well. In fact, I can confuse myself less by not having both chats in front of me. Which I have for the four years that we have done this program, I have had two windows stacked uh, showing me both chats. I don't have to do that anymore because they're all in one spot. I can have just one. It's amazing. Also, that means I can see more of chat at once. Okay. Uh, so what are we going to talk about today? I think I, I, I mentioned a little bit already, of course. But um, let me... Uh, we are, as I had said, um, looking at item number two on the list that Sam Moskowitz published in 1940, well, published is a strong term, sent to the uh, ma the Pulp Magazine Comet in 1940 as a letter to the editor. Uh, the editor uh, of Comet was F. Orland Tremaine and uh, Sam Moskowitz sent a letter that listed a bunch of stories that he deemed to be classics of science fiction um, that had previously been in the magazine Astound Astounding Stories under the editorship of F. Orland Tremaine. So it was a list of stories and he was like, I think these are classics. Only the stories were only about six years old at that point. Um, so now that they're significantly older, we're taking a look at them to see, you know, he said these were classics in 1940. How do they stand up? Are they really classics? So that's kind of what we're doing. Hi, Neo Gets. Um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, so uh, Sam Moskowitz was a um, US science fiction historian, author and anthologist. He also worked apparently under the name Sam Martin. Um, oh, Neo Gets, you're running around with no clothes for five streams in a row. <laughs> Thank you for the streak. So we looked at his info a month ago with the first story on his list. So I'm not going to dive too deeply into it. We also actually looked at Donald Wandre, who is the author of the story we're going to look at today, because he was also the author of the story that we looked at a month ago. 
The first two items on Sam's list were both authored by Donald Wandre, who um, <clears throat> was, as you can see here, U.S. At least I hope you can see here. I, I recently discovered, well, but does the text come through okay for you all? Because I used the same setup to teach a class over Zoom. And when I was sharing in this exact same way, it warped the text. Anyway. Um, oh, gosh. Welcome, Fluid Ann. Indeed, thank you for subbing. It's weird because I don't see the sub, but I see the bot saying welcome and thank you. <clears throat> there it is. 24 months. Woo! Thank you very much. Oh, and it's a prime sub too. That's awesome. Uh, where was I? Well, sitting here, but oh, yes. Donald Wandre, the author of the story we're going to look at, uh, was editor and author and founder with August Derleth in 1939 of Arkham House. Arkham House was one of the like, it's the big name in publishing of the original works of H.P. Lovecraft, which, yes, he is a, um, a problematic historical figure because of his uh, very well-known and well-documented association with um, the theories of white supremacy. Uh, and in poking around into the history of Donald Wandre last week, it didn't seem like he necessarily had the same uh, issues, but I couldn't say for certain. Um, I have not done extensive research on him. Hello, Lord Portico. Welcome to the new combined chat experience. Um, so anyway, the, the author wrote some stories in the Cthulhu Mythos, this, as far as I'm aware, is not going to be one of those. <laughs> um, the story we're going to be looking at is titled Colossus. Um, it's also was the like the title of a collected works uh, publication that came out in 1989. So. Uh, but I have not gone and seen, like, I haven't found just a ton about this story itself. So we'll be learning together as, as I read through part of this story. Um, <clears throat> just a refresher, Donald Wandre, um, born in 1908, died in 1987, American science fiction, fantasy, and weird fiction writer, po 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 poet, and editor. Uh, older brother of science fiction writer and artist Howard Wandre. I have no idea if I'm saying that last name correctly. That's just how it looks to me. If anybody knows better, please do correct me. Um, 14 stories in Weird, Weird Tales, another 16 in Astounding Stories, plus a few other places like Esquire. <clears throat> Co-founder of Arkham House. Um, born in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, in 1923, he began work as a part-time as a page boy in the circulation room of the St. Paul Public Library. Woohoo! Congratulations, Neo Gets! You've been randomly selected as a VIP for the stream. Enjoy the uh, digital cubic zirconia slash diamond that will appear next to your name in the chat. That's really the only prize for that and me saying thank you. Um, I don't know if it's cubic zirconia or a diamond though. I assume it's one of them. I'm curious to see what happens because both chats have a bot and they're both programmed with the same command. So I don't know if they're both going to post and both show up. We'll see how that works. Real diamonds can be pink, so why not? It, yeah. Um, I want to see if it mentions much 
about the actual story we're going to look at. Um, or actually, I believe it's the first of a series of stories. Uh, okay, 1930s. Uh, 33, and he's already into writing Hulu stuff. But then it jumps to 39. It doesn't really talk about losses. Let's see. Aha! During 1933, Wandre lived in a studio apartment in New York that was within easy walking distance of the offices of Street and Smith, who published astounding stories, so that Wandre could easily bring in a new story by hand. His story, Colossus, was the first thought variant story. Stories based on some new or not yet overworked idea, such as other dimensions or the time travel paradox. I think we're going to need to dig into that a little bit more. So far, they've only posted by, from one channel. Thank you, Hannah, for the observation. And... I hope that your work is fulfilling and profitable. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, helped revive the fortunes of Astounding under the editorship of his editorial mentor, F. Orland Tremaine. Uh, okay, so the first thought variant story. So the first, but I don't, so it says a thought variant story is a story based on some new or not yet overworked ideas such as other dimensions or the time travel paradox but that definition to me seems confusing because where we sit today other dimensions and time travel paradoxes are both very overworked ideas so would they no longer be thought variant stories? <laughs> that's that's where I'm struggling with that definition. So I think I think it's worth trying to figure out. Um, but also, uh, I want to pull up ISFDB because, as I said, I think Colossus is one in a series of stories. Um, astounding stories, and I want, uh, astounding stories. That does not appear to be Here we go. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, all right. F. Orland Truman, Astounding Stories. We're in 1934, January. Uh, January, 1934 edition of Astounding Stories. Colossus. Uh, yeah, it is indeed a novelette, and it is part of a series that includes Colossus and Colossus Eternal. And Colossus Eternal, it looks like, was published in the December 1934 issue. So if we have time, we'll peek at that. Um, but I just wanted to confirm. Okay, so um, I want to know about thought variant. Uh... Speculative fiction. Oh. Let's see what Wikipedia has to say. In December 33, Tremaine wrote an editorial calling, calling for thought variant stories that contained original ideas and did not simply reproduce adventure themes in a science fiction context. Aha. So that's where that phrase comes from is the call by the editor F. Orland Tremaine, who asked for thought variant stories. He Because he wanted stories that had original ideas and weren't produce, reproducing 
um, adventure stories. Uh, the early ones identified by him as thought variants were not always particularly original, but it soon became apparent that he was willing to take risks by publishing stories that would have fallen foul of the editorial taboos at other magazines. By the end of 34, Astounding was the leading science fiction magazine. And important stories published that year. <laughs> I wonder how many of these were ended up on the list that we're going to be looking at. I don't remember. Uh, I could try and find it, but um, <clears throat> basically 1934 Astounding is where all of the stories on the list came from. So it, there's a good chance we'll see some of these in uh, future streams. Anyway, how about we get started? Because here I have the January 1934 issue of Astounding. Um, a Street and Smith publication. Hi, hi, Stephen Joys. They have combined chat now. I am really excited about the fact that all of the chat is in one. <laughs> Both channels combined. I mean, I've been manually basically doing that for four years and now it's real and I'm excited. Um, okay, I want less like there, please. Um, all right, so. <laughs> Much chat, many meme. <laughs> Indeed, hi, Shadows of Life. Uh, this is, we looked this up. This is not the National Rifle Association. This is a different NRA. Um, <laughs> that's great, Stephen. <laughs> um, Oh, let's see, 1930. I'm looking it up again because I don't remember. The National Recovery Administration is what um, what, what that is. Um, <clears throat> all right. And the artwork here is specifically for the story we're after, Colossus by Donald Wondre. Um, So worth taking a glance at. I don't know who the artist is. Let's see if it tells us. It doesn't always. Um, somebody has done some repair work on the interior of the cover. Um, I don't see any listing of artists uh, on the title page here, which is usually where it would be. I'm going to double check in ISFDB real quick and see if it says, because there's a chance that somebody has figured it out and that it's in the database. Um, It says it was illustrated by Howard V. Brown. Um, so that's my best. Oh, there it is. It is there. Cover painting by Howard V. Brown. I just, I didn't see it until I knew what the name was. And then it was just like, here I am. If I was alive and armed with a sword and violently intended, I could have jumped up and stabbed you. That's a lot of ifs. Anyway. <laughs> so we're going to be looking at the feature novelette Colossus because it was deemed a classic six years after its publication by uh, Sam Moskowitz. A story with a new conception of the universe. <clears throat> and so we get the amazing illustration art. Let me, um, let me just... Put a weight on here so that I can adjust the camera and you all can see the entire image here because it is just just the greatest like look at that picture um and it's the caption at the bottom which is in very small print so you might not be able to read it it says titan 
My death will not serve you. Spare me from the knife. Um, and so presumably it's this person on the, um, just going, I know nothing about the story, just going entirely off the illustration. This would appear to be like a microscope. And so I'm guessing he's standing on like a glass microscope slide. Trying to get the attention of the, the person who is much, much bigger. Like that's how I interpret that image, knowing nothing of nothing about the story other than that it, the title is Colossus. Is it just me who hears the old X Men arcade Colossus yell anytime you hear the word Colossus? Um, I don't think it's just you. I think that's probably a um, uh, probably most children of the '90s who were at all interested in superheroes. All right. So I don't know how close I want to take this. I'm still making do as best I can. I do just, I, I, I have thoughts on fixes for the camera. I'm sad that it bounces so much. This is a decent camera and I like the, the ability to take it off. I just wish I could move it up and down um, more smoothly, and I've I've been looking at some rigs. Okay, a story with a conception so gigantic it goes beyond our farthest calculations by Donald Wandre, illustrated by Howard B. Brown. <clears throat> there, certain astronomers, picture is the picture of an expanding universe. The super system of the galaxies is dispersing as a puff of smoke disperses. Sometimes I wonder whether there may not be a greater scale of existence of things in which it is no more than a puff of smoke. Sir Arthur Eddington, The Expanding Universe, uh, Macmillan and Company, 1933. So sometimes authors um, will give you a quote at the beginning of a, a, a story, and that's basically like tone setting. So in some way, that quote was likely inspirational towards the story that gets told. Doesn't mean it will relate directly, but in some way it was inspirational to the author. Okay. <clears throat> And Stephen, what do you have coming up um, on your stream today? Is it... I can't remember which games you were playing. Um, I don't... Weren't you, like, climbing to heights earlier? Star Trucker tonight! Hey, that's perfect, since we're looking at speculative fiction. <laughs> I will consider uh, taking everybody over there afterwards. I mean, I always consider taking everybody over there afterwards because your community is awesome and you're a, a wonderful streamer. So the demo was very interesting. So now the full game is out. You're jumping into that. It is very thematically appropriate. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Like a flame in the sky, the golden red stratoplane circled Mount Everest and dipped toward its crest. Not so many years ago, that peak had been unclimbed, almost unknown, a challenge to man. Wintry gales tore across this top of the world, and cold rivaled, pre uh, and cold rivaled precipices to defeat assault. Okay, that's a weird sentence. What does that mean? Wintry gales tore across this top of the world and cold rivaled precipices to defeat a song. I don't know. My brain is not parsing that sentence properly, but... Oh, <laughs> Stephen. <laughs> Thank you. Um... <clears throat> All right, I'm just gonna read it and go on. It doesn't track 
clearly to me. Yeah. Uh, wintry gales tore across this top of the world, and cold rivaled precipices to defeat assault. The bitter winds still blew, but a man made tower rose higher than the old peak. And a landing field, which was a triumph of engineering, audacity, and genius, stretched over sheer space beside the tower. The circling stratoplane landed and rolled to a stop. The man who climbed out, Duane Sharon, seemed distinctive even in his heavy flying clothes. His hands were powerful. No one would have admired any single feature of his. The hair of casual brown, a weathered face, a nose far from classic, and eyes of gray that glittered or softened as occasion required. But the general effect was good. He had a kind of loose rhythm and a genial personality. He sauntered toward the great observatory of the WLAS, World League for the Advancement of Science. Fifteen years had been required to build and equip this observatory, which had been planned as long ago as 1960. Did we have a... We haven't been told a date for when this is happening. Presumably more than 15 years after 1960 based on the phrasing here. Once inside the tower, he identified himself and tossed a cheery word to the guard before sauntering into the observation room. Probably the 400-inch reflector of Mount Everest Observatory would never be surpassed. Man, on Earth, could go no further toward conquering the limitations of atmosphere, metals, and optics. Through this gigantic mirror, Underlying a telescope in whose construction the efforts of dozens of great minds had been united for years to produce an instrument of unrivaled accuracy, intricacy, and range, equipped with every device desired by and known to astronomers, study of the universe had reached a climax. A man of ascetic features was studying the reflector. His speculation must be idle, since the sun had not set. Calculations and symbols, equations and reductions covered a blackboard near him. A sheaf of scribbled pages lay on a table beside a heap of photographs, charts, and books. Professor Dowell had his own quarters, but he usually worked in the observation room itself. Here, the temperature always remained constant at 30 below zero, but special clothing warmed him and non-frosting goggles permitted vision. Dowell did not look up until Duane stood beside him. Even then, consciousness of another's presence was slow to dawn. Hello, am I intruding? Duane asked. Dowell blinked. A faraway look in his eyes faded. No, not at all. I'm glad you came. Here, have a chair. Sit down. Thanks. But I've been sitting in a plane for the last hour. I'd rather stand around for a while. Anything new? What's on your mind? The astronomer motioned toward the calculations. Uh, you remember when you were here the day before yesterday? And I showed you photographs we made of the 31st magnitude nebulae in the Orion group. Of course. You said they marked a milepost in astronomy. Did I? Yes, yes, to be sure. Just to think that only 18 magnitudes were visible until we built this telescope. And now there are 31, while the known universe has been expanded to nearly a billion light years. Don't, protested Duane. That's too much. The professor did not hear him. I'm puzzled about a monom uh, I'm puzzled about a phenomenon of the 32nd magnitude. What is it? There is no 32nd magnitude. Duane reflected, lit a cigarette. That's very interesting, he remarked. I don't understand. Dowell fretted. Neither do I. Several nights ago, we photographed nebulae of the 31st magnitude. According to Jean's theory and Balma's equations of the expanding universe, uh, there should be nebulae up to about the 40th magnitude. And there aren't? Right. What's the reason? I don't know. There are only two possible answers. Either Valma made an error, which is inconceivable, or our whole theory of the universe is wrong. 
Duane thought this over. No. Dowell paced back and forth nervously. <clears throat> you know the three main theories of the universe, of course. You know the three main theories of the universe, of course. There's the old one that space is limitless and extends forever in all directions. There is the theory established by Einstein early this century that space is affected with a curvature which makes it return upon itself. After Einstein, a group headed by Jean advanced the idea of an expanding universe which might be said to create space as it expanded. Yes, I'm familiar with them and some others, Duane commented. No doubt, but nebulae and dark spots from the 31st to 40th magnitudes do not exist, though they should. That may mean any of several possible explanations. Perhaps the universe has stopped expanding. Perhaps it is stationary or even contracting now. Or if Einstein was right, perhaps the outer star clusters have swerved through the curvature of space so that they are now approaching us instead of receding. That would account for the surprising number of aggregates in the 29th to 31st magnitudes. Possibly the oldest theory is correct, that some unknown set of factors prevents us from seeing galaxies beyond the 31st order. There are other possibilities. What's your guess? No, Dowell replied querulously. But there is a fourth alternative that has almost driven me mad. Just to think about it. So, what's this one? Dowell polished his glasses. I don't know whether I can explain it. The concept is so gigantic. Well, here goes. You are familiar with the atomic theories. Has it ever occurred to you that all the billions of stars that form all the millions of nebulae and galaxies of our whole universe might be only the electrons of a superatom upon which vast beings might exist as we dwell upon the surface of Earth? That concept would explain the absence of nebulae beyond the 31st magnitude. From there on would be an outer shell or invisible plane of energy and tension that encloses our universe but is substantial enough for beings to live on. There is no such thing as solid Earth. The apparently solid matter we are standing on is, ultimately, atoms, electrons, vibration, with spaces between each particle comparatively as great as those between the stars and galaxies. The voice of the astronomer trembled in presenting this tremendous theme. What might happen if someone from Earth could burst through that superatom? Duane pondered. It's a staggering conception. If you carry it out to its limit, that giant atom might only be it might be only one of billions of other atom worlds on a scale we can't even begin to imagine. And all that super universe forming what? A molecule. And there might be on this on that still vaster universe still more tremendous beings. And that molecule might be only one of billions of other molecules sewn through trillions of trillions of light years of space and forming even... Don't! Duane cried. It's too big. I can hardly grasp it. <clears throat> he stared at the reflector. When sunset came, its vast disk would gather the light of stars from far places. Light that had been traveling since land boiled out of steaming seas and formed continents on young Earth. Lights of infinity. The stars would record their being upon plates for men like Dowell to analyze. <clears throat> In the old days, the prophets had looked at the night sky and bowed to God who made Earth the center of the universe of fixed stars. Then, the scientists had come to prove that the sun was the center only of a planetary system that moved in a universe. Then, the astronomers had shown that a spiral haze in Andromeda was a galactic universe 800,000 light years away, and that the whole Milky Way was only a galaxy among thousands. So, the roll of star fields mounted and the boundaries swept outward, and men's imaginations, roving afar, found new glory 
while the universe expanded and its depth staggered understanding. Beyond the stars lay nebulae, gaseous and spiral and helical, with vast voids between, until by 1933, some 30 million galaxies were identified in a range of 200 million light years. And by Duane's time, with the Mount Everest telescope, the range had risen to over 800 million light years, comprising 150 million galaxies, each composed of millions of stars. Tell me, Dowell requested, how is the white bird coming along? Is she about ready? It was stupid of me to bore you with my guesswork. Don't mention it, Duane answered. It wasn't dull. The mere idea of limitless space is as exciting as life itself. As for the white bird, she'll be done by October. The power converters are being installed now. I think that a preliminary test can be made in September. I see. Perhaps you'll have the honor of informing us astronomers what the outer universe really is like, Duane retorted. Long before then, you'll have worked out the one theory that my voyage will only prove to be true. I still wonder if the theory you mentioned a while ago could be right. What would happen if the white bird could carry us through? If there were beings on that giant atom, they would never see you. So infinitesimal would you be. We have never seen an electron, let alone anything that might be on an electron. And you could never get there in a million lifetimes, even at the speed of light. True, Duane answered thoughtfully, but I haven't told you the whole story. The white bird draws on intraspatial emanations and radiations. It has unlimited power. It should be able to reach a maximum velocity of thousands of light years per second. What? shrilled Dowell, his face shining with excitement. Do you realize what that means? You and the white bird would extend in the direction of flight until you were as tenuous as a gas and elongated to thousands or even millions of times your first proportion. The ship would swell sideways as well from the transverse energy pull of the universe. You might become huger than Earth or the solar system or even our galaxy. You would be Colossus himself and you would never realize any change because you would have nothing for comparison. Duane, if you do it, you may burst through to that giant atom and you would be visible to, uh, you would be visible to and could perceive whatever was on it. The galaxy on Orion's belt. Oh. Which one? Which galaxy is on Orion's belt, Shadows? I'm not sure I'm understanding the reference that you're throwing out there. I need more context, but uh, that's probably just me. Uh, Duane. <laughs> oh, 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 Man in Black. Thank you. Thank you, Neo Guts. I was not... <laughs> yes. I wasn't in the mindset of movie references at the moment. <clears throat> Duane, overwhelmed, looked dreamy-eyed. Vast concepts, he murmured. They're too much for my brain. Colossus, Dowell half-whispered as though his, this vision, this apex of cosmic conjecture, dominated his mind and exerted a Hypnotic fascination. Colossus of time, space, and matter. Even the mention of such a journey appalls me. I wish I could go with you. Nothing would please me better. I know, but if Anne is along, by the way, I suppose you would like to see Anne. Duane, the chain of cosmic theory broken, made gestures of mock deprecation. Oh my, no, Anne. Why, I merely came from America to make sure that Mount Everest was still standing. I like that. A musical, but at the moment sarcastic. Oh, I like that. A musical, but at the moment sarcastic. Voice broke in. So it's Mount Everest you're here to see and not me? Well, you can have Mount Everest. 
With truly feminine peak, the girl who had entered banged the door as she went out. Anne was not a beauty in the sense of Mona Lisa or a movie star. She had, above all, animation of expression, clearness of thought, and more than average appeal. Her dynamic qualities were masculine wit, reason, energy, originality. Her aesthetic characteristics were feminine changeability, or feminine changeability, the figure of a patrician, Nordic features with mahogany colored hair, a rhythmic stride, and beauty of motion. Interesting, we got a lot more about her appearance than we did either of the two men. I did did he describe the first guy at all? Wayne was wearing heavy flying clothes. He has powerful hands. <clears throat> Hair casual brown, a weathered face, nose that's not classic, and gray eyes. It's so a little bit of description of him. And the other guy is a man of ascetic features. Which is literally the only description that we have of him. Why gender wit? Yeah, why gender wit? I mean, but, but it's so that you know that in the workplace, she can joke with the guys because she has a, a, a masculine wit. So it's, it's fine if they, you know, make off color jokes because she's okay with it. At least I assume, I don't know, it's 1934. That's why they gender wit. Anyway. Uh, probably she was most effective when annoyed, as at present, for the triumph of emotion over reason lent her face a kind of hectic charm, and she made a study of strength and weakness. Duane turned to Dowell. If you will excuse me, I'll try to make my peace. I go right ahead. It took little time to find Anne. It required patience to pacify her. He need not have done so, but he found delight in playing up to her, to her mood. The game of pursuit and the world of pretense would never change, however long Earth wore away to old age. Two. The holidays of August drew to a close. September came in with a burst of riotous colors through forests and hills. Work on the white bird came to an end. What holidays are in August? Are they just talking about like, like, in an American context, it would be like summer break. I suppose in Europe, there are places where people go on holiday. Is that what he's meaning by the holidays? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, anyway, work on the white bird came to an end. Professor Dowell knew of its imminent launching. So did Anne. The world did not. Duane figured that there would be ample time to tell the world after of success or failure. It was a windless evening whose chill approached frost when he and Anne stood beside the white bird at Havenside, north of New York. Almost anything can happen, Duane said gravely. The ship may not work. Something might go wrong. Or we might run into dangers beyond our knowledge. Do you know what you are letting yourself in for? Anne looked at him with slightly disgusted eyes. I'm not a child. Forget this protective business. Let's go. Duane sighed. Anne's realism was disconcerting. The girl's eyes sparkled as she looked at the white bird. Only you could have built such a thing of beauty, she said, and impulsively clung to Duane. She darted off as he made a futile grab and laughed at him, teasing. That wasn't an invitation, Duane. The devil it wasn't, Duane shouted in exasperation and dived after the fleet-footed girl. Breathless, they came to the white bird's entrance. The ship lay long and low in the light of the full moon. It shone with a glow like phosphorus, a hundred feet in length 
the cylinder, never more than 10 feet thick, tapered to points. Crystallite comp composed its shell. Crystallite, that strange element, number 99, invented by chemists. What? Okay. Um, just because this was, this was written in 19... 33, 34. Um, I'm going to look up what the actual element 99 is. Because uh, I don't know off the top of my head. Is there a 99? Uh, ninety-eight, ninety-nine. 99. The actual element 99 is Einsteinium. Um, Einsteinium. Synthetic chemical element. Hey. Uh, uh, there are elements in the 200s, but I wasn't sure if they were all sequentially numbered or not as I was, because I was going through the chart and it jumped. And so I, I couldn't remember. It's been forever since I took chemistry. Um, but, uh, it's interesting to me in the story here, the, um, <clears throat> element 99 that he named crystallite, um, was a man-made synthetic chemical. Our memories are all out of date. Yeah. I liked chemistry, but it had no direct bearing on anything I was doing in my life. So it was a class I enjoyed in high school and have not revisited since. And, and I, I remember I, um, I enjoyed the calculation of chemical formulas and the periodic table of elements much more than I enjoyed the experiments in the lab. <clears throat> Mostly because I'm clumsy and I was afraid of blowing things up. <laughs> anyway, Einsteinium is a synthetic chemical element. The, um, the crystallite was a synthetic element. Uh, it has symbol ES and atomic number 99. It is named after Albert Einstein and is a member of the uh, actinide series and is the seventh transuranium element. Um... All right, so actinides, uh, 14 me metallic chemical elements in the 5F series with atomic numbers 89 to 102, actinium to nobelium. Uh, and transuranian elements um, are anything with atomic numbers greater than 92, which is the atomic number of uranium. All of them are radioactively unstable and decay into other elements. With the exception of Newtonium and Plutonium. <laughs> Apparently. Uh, okay, so um, Einsteinium was discovered as a component of the debris of the first hydrogen bomb explosion in 1952. Its most common isotope, on Einsteinium-253, is produced artificially from decay of Californium-253 in a few dedicated high-power nuclear reactors with a total yield on the order of one milligram per year. Reactor synthesis is followed by a complex process of separating Einsteinium-253 from other actinides and products of their decay. Other isotopes are synthesized in various laboratories, but in much smaller amounts by bombarding heavy actinide elements with light ions light ions. Do the, do the small amounts of produced Einsteinium and the short half-life of its most common isotope, there are no practical applications for it except basic scientific research. In particular, Einsteinium was used to synthesize for the first time 17 atoms of the new element Mendelevium in 1955. It is a soft, silvery, paramagnetic metal. Its chemistry is typical of the late actinides with a preponderance of the uh, plus three, uh, I'm, yeah. If you want to read more, you can explore. Uh, this is just the Wikipedia article on Einsteinium. Um, <clears throat> I'm curious. So this one was found in, uh, like, first recorded in, what did they say, 1952? 
so if I go backwards, I want to see... Hi, <laughs> Key Squared! Yes! Um, so in, in the story that we're reading, um, the author in 1934 is writing about um, events happening in the future. All we know is that it's at least 1975, but probably further in the future than that, um, that the author is projecting. Uh, the story was published in 34, and um, <clears throat> so the spaceship that the characters are about to get into is composed primarily of crystallite, or at least its shell is primarily crystallite, which he says um, is a synthetic element invented by chemists, transparent as glass, the color of platinum, higher tensile strength than any other metal, combined with a melting point above 6,000 degrees Celsius, um, and that it was the uh, atomic number 99. So we looked to see what actually is atomic number 99, um, which brought us to Einsteinium. And now I'm just, I'm going backwards on the um, periodic table to see what element, like how many of these came after this story was written. I want, like, does the chart have the date that it was found? Discovery 1949. Okay. Uh, so I want to see, I'm just curious, because this was, the story's from 1933-34. Um, did I go too far? Or not far enough? <laughs> 1944. All right, we've got 10 years worth to go back. Uh, element 44. Or or that was the year. America. Um, that one's hard to say. <laughs> Americium. It's Americium, but it's spelled and looks like America. Americium. Uh, that's also 1944. Americium is a lot easier to say. You were pulling out the year. Thank you. Oh, plutonium. Uh, which is 1940. I like that these are linked and you can just go... Um, through the table like this. That is a lovely imp implementation of, uh, of uh, navigation that is user-focused uh, in the Wikipedia here. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Aw. Sadly, the, the hover doesn't give me the date discovered, um, so I still have to do this. 1940. All right, uranium. Articles that like, slide through a list in a category. Yeah, I do. I like it a lot. I like it a lot. Um, okay, and and so we get to uranium, which was discovered in 1789. That makes me wonder. So uranium. 1789, and then the first trans-Uranian element, Neptunium, wasn't until 1940. So my curiosity then is if Uranium is 19, or 1739. If I ignore the trans-Uranian elements, yeah, sorry, 1789. If I ignore transuranian elements and go for um, other types of elements, I'm wondering 
where that takes us. All right, so that's 1984. Passium. Uh, let's go back further in the... Look at Iridium. Iridium was discovered in 1803. All right, so that's too far back. But my thought process... The reason I had the thought was that um, the author was proposing um, element 99 as a crystalline element, which made me think that he wasn't thinking in terms of transuranian elements. Of course not, because they hadn't discovered any. Um, so I thought, let's look at the solid elements. Um, gold, I wonder what it's going to say for when it was discovered. Before 6000 BCE. Um, I, I think our dates of discovery navigation has, has broken now. Uh, it would, key squared. I will go for that. <laughs> I was about to look for that because I was like, um, yeah, navigation failed me. It worked for the transuranians, but when we got to the actual, like, other other chemical elements, it, it didn't work so well. Um, all right. This article may overuse or misuse color. Um, okay. All right. By era of discovery. Okay, so what do the colors mean? Uh, I want orange one. Astonine, possible, bronchium, all right, so let's see, 14 elements discovered between 1900 and 1949 in X-ray spectroscopy and radiochemistry. Uh, allows for many radioactive elements and the final stable elements to be discovered, recognition of the atomic number as a defining element. Okay. Ooh, graphical timeline. Yes, please. Um, all right, we're looking for like 19, the, the first one after 1934, which is plutonium. which wasn't until 1940. But if we go to the physical elements, let's see, we've got... Okay. I'm... Curium? Am Americium? Uh, Neptunium. I think that when I clicked, I don't think it's... I don't think that's actually supposed to link me to Plutonium. There's a data table lower down. That will be better. <laughs> of course there is. Seven thousand BC. Um, we, we have a little bit of time to traverse here. Nitrogen? Yttrium, 1794. Sorry, I... We have not done a whole lot with the periodic table on, on this stream. I... I enjoy the periodic table of elements. I don't really know why I enjoy it. I just do. I have fun learning about the elements. Uh, all right, 1906, 1908, 1913, Protractinum. 
no, pro protractinium. It's very satisfying. Yeah. Oh, it was one of the first, um, like, highlight, like, featured apps when they first announced the iPad. And there was, there's an Elements app that was uh, one of the first ones that showed off sort of the capabilities of the early iPad. Um, I had so much fun with that app. Yeah, okay, so Hafnium would have been the last element discovered before he wrote this story. Um, so now I'm curious what is... Uh, found the element in rare earth residues. Neither claim was confirmed due to World War One, and neither could be confirmed later as the chemistry they reported does not match that known for hafnium. <laughs> found it by X-ray spectroscopy analysis in Norwegian Zircon. The last stable element to be discovered. Noting, however, the difficulties regarding the discovery of rhenium. Uh, looks at poster of the table of elements on my wall. I also like it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just... It has an organization to it that I find satisfying. Um, okay, so... Um, the first element discovered after this story was written was... Um, technetium? Oh, it's not gonna... I was hoping if I clicked on it, it would maybe play how it sounds. Uh... Oh, okay, so it's technetium. Technetium. Chemical element. Symbol TC. Yeah, I, I was clicking on TC for sure, and I knew that that wasn't plutonium. I was very confused. Um, and so this was like atomic number 43. Um, lightest element whose isotopes are all radioactive. Technetium and promethium are the only radioactive elements whose neighbors, in the sense of atomic number, are both stable. All available technetium is produced as a synthetic element. So producing synthetic elements was contemporaneous with when the story was written. Naturally occurring technetium is a spontaneous fission product in uranium ore and thorium ore, the most common source, or the product of neutron capture in molybdenum ores. Uh, this silver gray crystalline transition metal lies between manganese and rhenium in group seven of the periodic table, and its chemical properties are intermediate between those of both adjacent elements. The most common naturally occurring Occurring isotope is 99 technetium in traces only. You almost used it for your first story. Randomly, following a chain of Google searches related to this led me to a cool oral history in the Virginia Tech collection that you're bookmarking to listen to later. It's even work related. Which one? Which one? I'm curious. Um, <clears throat> the reason I got excited while reading this is the author postulated a crystalline metallic element that was artificially produced that forms the shell of the spacecraft. And the first element discovered in reality after he wrote the story is a crystalline metallic element that is artificially created. <laughs> so I, I just love, like, he was hypothesizing crystalline metallic elements being synthetically manufactured. And the first element discovered after he wrote the story fit those parameters. Except that it's highly radioactive where I don't think the, the crystal light he was proposing uh, would be. Luther Bryce. Oh, yeah, um, Luther's got some good oral histories there. You almost used technetium as a witness for one of your tech-based characters. As a weakness. 
for one of your tech. That's awesome. Anyway, this was a good digression. I'm I I like we paused the story because curiosity. It's, this is what my brain wants to do when I'm reading stories, and most of the time I just stay sitting there and keep reading. But like, <clears throat> he mentioned this element called crystallite, and and says that it's number ninety nine, and and I had to go and look up what ninety nine was, and then from there I had to find out what was the closest one in discovery time to when the story was written. And it matches what he was proposing. Yeah. Reminds you of Larry Niven's later known space stories with uh, vast monomolecular synthetic spaceship hulls. I don't know. I don't know if, he, if this might have been an inspiration. I do definitely see um, this. So crystallite is described here as Invented by chemists, a transparency of glass, the color of platinum, and a higher tensile strength than any other metal, combined with a melting point above 6,000 degrees C. It sounds like Star Trek's transparent aluminum to me. And I would not be surprised to find out that transparent aluminum was inspired by this story. And uh, the art from the cover... I wondered about the art on the cover, which is related to this story, but it makes sense now because the outer shell of the ship is clear like glass. Hello, computer. <laughs> exactly. Um, I I did not do a great Scottish there, but I I tried. I don't have a lot of practice with uh, Scottish accents at all. Um, okay. I don't have a lot of practice with accents. Uh, the White Bird's interior contained only essentials. A pilot room, a cabin. I hope that the toilet area is in an area where the hull isn't completely transparent. Eh, whatever. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just realized like it's like living in a glass house. I'm like, there are some problems with having a fully transparent outer hull. I mean, a number one, any humans inside would be blind very quickly. <laughs> well, you're in space. It's not as though there are a lot of nosy neighbors. This is also true, Key Square. <laughs> Had assumed the art was making an artistic cutaway. Rat. I did two neogets, but it's actually a property of the ship as described. Um, okay, sorry, I digressed. Uh, interior contained only essentials, a pilot room, a cabin, a supply room, and the front and rear power compartments. The torpedo looked bizarre, for its shell was transparent, but the inner walls dividing room from room were of vanachrome, that thin rubbery steel, which was virtually indestructible. Ooh. A rubbery steel, a pliable steel. That, that's an interesting idea. Um, wow, that would change construction in so many ways. <clears throat> to look at the white bird was to look into a house like a glass cylinder and see the rooms within. Though from within, no room could be seen from any other room. Space is big. You just won't believe how vastly, hugely, mind-bogglingly big it is. Um, you are correct, Shadow Supply. I'm trying to remember what that's from. And my brain is... I remember... I recognize the quote, but I don't... I, I, I read a lot of science fiction. I can't place exactly what it's from. I'm guessing... It sounds like Hitchhiker's Guide, but I don't know for certain. Um, <clears throat> okay. I'll never get over this funny arrangement, Anne remarked as they entered. The whole world can look inside, but I have to walk from room to room to see what's there. It is from Hitchhiker's Guide. It's the opening line. Great. Yeah. <laughs> Not a bad idea, Dwayne answered cheerfully. 
Anne's eyelids went down. Dwayne fidgeted. He suddenly stated, Let's go, and pushed a button. The white bird curved up from the ground like a real bird, soaring after a dive. Oh, exclaimed Anne. You should have warned me. Her face sobered. The great adventure had begun. Isn't it strange, she asked in a very small voice and with very big eyes. It's a miracle, Duane answered. His fingers caressed the dials as he spoke. Just to think that a simple condenser transformer picks up cosmic radiations all around us, turns them to power, and drives us on. Power by radio. More power than we could ever use. Out of thin air. I mean, radio power does not come out of thin air. Although, if you could capture and use radio power as a power source, there is um, just radio that I suppose you could call out of thin air because it is just ambient in the universe. But it doesn't technically actually come out of thin air. It's produced by uh, luminous uh, celestial bodies. Also, the cosmic background radiation is radio, isn't it? To be frank, Tesla tried, but fell afoul of the inverse square law. <clears throat> Anne emerged from her awe, but she seemed a different girl with more of the poetic about her. There was indeed a new luminous quality to her face while she took in the impressive spectacle of the skies. The white bird, at steadily mounting speed, passed beyond the stratosphere. Above them, the sky darkened and blackened. Stars brightened to a brilliance that dazzled the eyes. Then the sun of the solar system became visible beyond Earth, and the light of the sun and its reflected glare from Earth and moon bathed the white bird in a flood of radiance so bright that Duane and Anne donned goggles, and the craft's interior became perceptible perceptibly warmer in spite of the crystallite, the crystallite hull. Technically, you can, you can make a small FM radio that's powered by the radio waves. Oh, Neo gets that. Those would be like the crystal radios that we used to get kids to make as kids in the 80s. Right? Hmm. I have no idea how old you are, honestly. I just, I know that when when I was a kid in the 80s, there were crystal radio kits that you could get. And I don't think they required any sort of batteries or external power source. So I think they were just powered by the radio waves themselves. Um, there was a glory to the skies, a spacious sweep, an infinite majesty of stars that ranged from brilliant white to faint and faraway orange, from pale blue to flame red and emerald green which silenced the Voyagers by its cosmic beauty. You're a 90s kid? <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I don't know how you class who's an 80s kid or a 90s kid or whatever. Like, I was an 80s kid if you... Oh, <laughs> that see that Moobot command? That's, uh, that's from the other channel. Um... Yeah, if you're talking like elementary school age and, and like, then I was an 80s kid. If you're talking like high school age, then I was a 90s kid. <laughs> anyway, I do that as an illustration in class. Sometimes a big antenna that lights up a flash bulb, a flashlight bulb dimly, just from the radio waves, but it doesn't scale well. That would be that inverse square law that you were talking about. Um, <clears throat> It was long before either traveler spoke, and steadily the white bird fled outward, erasing the way to the moon in ever faster time. Anne broke the reverie. She waved her hand toward the universe. If all this affects us so much, she said simply, what would we feel out there? She pointed toward the faintest star, out where the spiral nebulae began in Andromeda. When I go there, perhaps I can answer that, Duane replied. A dreamy look entered Anne's eyes, and they shone with an almost mystical fervor. 
I have a queer idea, Duane. Maybe it wouldn't be so different from Earth. Back home, everything is related to something else. The same trees grow every spring, the same sun rises, and the days are always alike. Don't look so skeptical, you know what I mean. Of course, they aren't the same trees, and the days are separated by time. And there aren't any two persons alike, but just the same nature repeats it herself. And there seems to be some sort of pattern to everything, a pattern that unites everything and recurs again and again. She ended with a breathless rush of words. I think you're right, Duane mused, but who knows? I don't. I don't suppose anyone will ever know unless he can go out there where the stars end. Why don't we? A hectic note heightened Anne's voice and her cheers flushed with excitement. Why don't we? Duane echoed. Why, I mentioned it to Professor Dowell and we joked about it, but I never really expected to go beyond the planets. Mysterious raptures burned in Anne's eyes. I wonder what's beyond the stars. That question, which the wisest philosophers never have been able to answer, and the most learned astronomers have fretted in vain to solve, brought only reflective silence from Duane for a long period. I don't know he said at last. Professor Dowell thinks I might break through and discover that our whole universe is just an atom, and that the great atom might be only one world among billions forming a still more gigantic molecule. Why, Anne, if he's right... Anne looked dazed. What an idea! He'll go mad thinking about it! Why, it gives me the creeps! I don't wonder! I once took a course in biology. If we are essentially like matter... Then electrons make atoms that form cells that compose organs, which are part of a body. If that's so, Duane, and you got on to the giant atom world and could go still farther, you might eventually come out on a vast living organism of which Earth is merely part of a single cell. Now you're giving me the creeps. Don't think about it. The idea is maddening. It's all I can do just to picture the giant atom. Anne went on recklessly. With morbid mischief. Darling, maybe someone like you, on one of those invisible particles inside you, is traveling outward now on a spaceship and is going to burst through on a cell. And, and you'll feel just a little twitch in your side, and maybe he'll keep on going and pop out of your brain finally. And Duane stopped this merciless and all too vivid description by the simple process of kissing Anne's inviting lips. Well, historically appropriate, if not um, what one should do. Oh, gosh, we're being raided. Hello and welcome, 16-Bit Eric. Uh, welcome in, Whimsies. It is great to have you joining us. Um, let me shout out 16-Bit uh, Eric. If you are not already following 16-Bit Eric, I do encourage you to do so. Um, Eric is... My favorite streamer, my favorite storyteller. Uh, he does a lot of tabletop role-playing game stuff, um, plays video games, has a wonderful, wonderful community, and um, you should follow and watch because he's awesome. Uh, but also, hi, Whimsies. Um, I am uh, Rogan27. Um, I am the community collections archivist here at Virginia Tech. And um, you came in on the Rogan27 channel. This show is our, called Archival Adventures. And once a week, I share things from um, the archives and special collections at uh, Virginia Tech. And so I stream to two channels. Um, thank you for the follow between planets. Uh, so I stream to my personal channel, the Rogan27 channel that you came in on, as well as the library's channel, which is um, twitch.tv slash Studios. And for once, the chat is like meshed into one um because new new capabilities from twitch and i can mix the chat all together in one so um i'm having fun with that uh today we are um it's the last wednesday of the month so we're looking at speculative fiction and we are looking at a story titled Colossus by the author Donald Wandre. It was published in the January 1934 issue of Astounding Stories and um, was the first of the uh, 
thought variant stories uh, in response to F or editor F. Orlin Tremaine's request for stories with original ideas that were not simply retellings of adventure stories in a space setting. Um, and so we have been reading about um, the character Duane and the character Anne, who are, um, it looks like right now, test piloting a rocket ship called the White Bird. Um, that, And they're discussing the concept, this idea that the universe is actually, like our entire universe is actually just part of an atom that makes up a much larger universe. Um, and so that's that's where we're at. Um, we did uh, take a digression and explore the periodic table of elements because the author um, invented an element, atomic number 99, uh, called, um, oh, what was it? I've already forgotten. Uh, crystallite. Uh, that he called crystallite um, that basically had the properties of transparent aluminum, if you're familiar with Star Trek. Um, in, and we had to look and see what uh, what atomic number 99 actually was. Turns out that it's Einsteinium. But uh, in exploring, we found out that um, technetium was the first element discovered after the story was written. And it, surprisingly, has very similar properties to the crystallite element he made up that sounds a lot like the inspiration for transparent aluminum. Um, anyway, hi! <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome in. Uh, Blue Rooster, it's good to see you. Um, Rachel Tensions, it is all, it is good to see you. Uh, and Bit Rebellious, welcome in. Um, uh, Bit Rebellious, it is a, uh, I think I just said, but I'll say again, because um, I don't know if you posted that after I said it or not. Um, it's a story called Colossus by the author Donald Wandre, um, and it was published in January of 1934. Uh, okay. So, <laughs> the, the character, the two characters are on the rocket ship right now, and Dwayne, um, in order to stop Anne, who was extending the thought experiment about or the, the the thinking about um this gigantic universe that they're just an infinitesimal small uh, like atomic particle like that our universe isn't just an atomic particle of um she was just going going with the idea um and so he um, stopped her by kissing her but he didn't ask for permission but in 1934 would you expect him to probably not so not surprising, but also, yeah, best not to kiss people unless you know that they want that they want you to. Anyway, she broke away. What a man! Is that all you think about? Sure, when I'm with you, he answered candidly, and then serious again. But don't forget, Anne, that the world is a powder mine right now. If war comes, all trips are off. War? She blazed. You would agree to murder and give up the pursuit of something that will mean more than all the wars in history? I will never love you for that. Duane kept a thoughtful silence. Oh gosh, welcome back, Hannah. I hope that work has been treating you well. <clears throat> Visions beyond infinity and past eternity changed gradually to speculation about the moon which loomed ever larger overhead. The buoyant feeling that Duane and Anne should have experienced as they drew away from the attraction of gravitation did not materialize since the speed of the white bird counteracted it. The moon swelled, cut off a fifteenth, a tenth, a fifth of the sky above. Their viewpoint modified. Instead of flying upward, they found themselves falling. The new perspectives of space gave rise to new experiences and unfamiliar sensations. They had been shooting upward from Earth. Now they were descending toward the moon. Duane cut off their power. The white bird fell at furious speed. He turned on the forward repellers, unloosing upon the moon's surface an invisible bombardment of energy that almost counterbalanced their speed. 
the white bird plunged less rapidly, slowed, and finally hung a few thousand feet above the moon. Only Dore could have reamed it, exclaimed Anne. Great craters pitted its surface. Masses of slag and lava flowed down the sides of extinct mountains, and fissures like the marks of giants' swords marred its lowlands. Okay, who is Dore? Is this a name I should know? Because I don't. Um. Ooh. Let's see. Paul Gustav Louis Christophe Doré. Born 1832, died 1883, a French printmaker, illustrator, painter, comics artist, caricaturist, and sculptor. Best known for his prolific output of wood engravings, including classic literature, especially those for the Vulgate Bible and Dante's Divine Comedy. Key squared, you are... You are spot on, Gustav Dore. <laughs> no, no, it's it's great. I just was like, it took me a couple seconds to find it. Um, I did not know his name. I have seen his work. Um, okay. Like it was just in here, to the point where I, it like assumes that everybody knows who Dore was, but whatever. <clears throat> Dead sea bottoms and barren continents alone suggested life of long ago. These and certain clusters that might have been cities, masses of granite, blocks of marble and basalt, quartz and silica, arranged in geometric formations. Were these ruinous heaps the remains of cities? Ah, yes, 1934, before we had really good imagery of the surface of the moon. Um, and so imagining that a civilization had been there in the past, totally possible. Uh, and a civilization flourished here, of a race that had perished, leaving only its works to crumble beneath the everlasting encroachments of time? What legends and records, achievements and histories might lie beneath those shards? Duane drew in a deep breath. The answer would never be known to men. Great as the curiosity was that impelled him to study the riddles of the moon, the dangers were greater, and greater still the goal of his dream. There was a mystery to all the universe. What lay beyond? Where would the end be? If one started off and traveled at random in any direction for as long as space lasted or life permitted? Let's land, cried Anne. Just imagine walking on the moon, and we can do it with your space suits. Not now. We ought to be returning to Earth. There's little to be gained by landing, and a lot that we might lose. Anne looked hurt. All this way, all this trouble, and we don't find out what's on the moon. Duane, exasperated, cursed inwardly this plague of woman's desire, this wish to exhaust the moment. Aloud, he answered, We can always come. I've proved what I wanted, the white bird's capacity. Let's head home. Our next trip will take us. Well, wait and see. I'm going to drop a historical terms because of the um, sexism inherent in this part of the story. <laughs> um. Where will we go? Outside. Away to the end of things, wherever that might be. The white bird can do it, and I'm going to where space ends. Whatever lies beyond the universe, empty and endless space or giant atom, I'll find with you. Anne's eyes shone. She held the breathless appearance of a mystic to whom a vision of glory comes. You were just about to mention that. Someone needs to send this guy to HR. I mean, it, it, this story... This story is super tame. It was published in 1934. It could be a heck of a lot worse. Especially because this author is one of the uh, original creators of um, Arkham House, which was the <clears throat> magazine that published um, 
Wow, hello, brain. The Cthulhu things. Lovecraft. Um, <laughs> it was the magazine that, that published Lovecraft's work, and he was a contemporary and, and was one of the creators of that magazine and was in social circles and in, in business relationships with Lovecraft, who was not a very great person for what we would consider to be like social respect today. This is super tame, given the year and the society that he was living with. <clears throat> the dream transfigured her face as she gazed at infinity and saw the far places Sappho might have had so lovely and rapturous an aspect uh, when she stood on a cliff of Lesbos and looked at the sweep of sky and wine dark sea. Never before and never again did Anne's expression achieve such beauty. And Duane, as he watched her, absorbed something of her mood. That supernal wonder which the old philosophers and the great poets and the prophets have been gifted with. Alexander, wishing for more worlds to conquer, Marco Polo, wending his way across lands of legend, Columbus, sailing upon unknown waters, Peary, assaulting the roof of the world, Lindbergh, winging through the skies, the ghosts of all the master explorers and travelers of the past haunted him and he felt an invisible presence urging him on to that voyage for which history, and almost thought, had no counterpart. An exaltation of spirit possessed the two, and spontaneously they leaned together in unity of mood and vision. The way is homeward, said Duane at last. And outward, echoed Anne. She lifted her hazel eyes to his, and even he, well as he knew her, was startled by the unfathomable depths that they showed. Almost regretfully, he sent the white bird flying earthward, and the crag-strewn, jagged, white ruin of the moon's surface fell swiftly away, paled into softer outline, until once again, like a silver disk in the sky, it floated, glowing and lovely, and bathed in soft radiance. Then, the majesty of stars and the procession of the Milky Way and earth looming large. A buoyancy of spirit raised Duane to a peak of mental intoxication. Hello, Iron Trout. How are you today? Here in open space, he felt a sense of freedom, such as he had never known before. Was it the nearness of Anne, whose mere presence influenced him strangely? His partial escape from the attraction of gravitation? Or a headiness? that came inevitably from this preliminary voyage. He looked at the moon and earth, sun and stars, the great void beyond, and then back to Anne. Anne's eyes were refreshing, especially when they were as large and reliant as now. Duane parked her beside him on the way back. There was a mutual need for physical reality in the presence of space rampant. <clears throat> Little facial Scruff looks good on me. Uh, yeah, I haven't decided yet whether I'm going to let it stay and grow a little bit or not. It's been a long time since I had a beard. Um, we'll see. It's coming in very white. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> September marched into October, and the maples vied with the oaks in colors of russet and tawny and flame. Earth throbbed with the activity that was industrializing Africa, tapping energy from the Gulf Stream, capitalizing power from the sun. Socialized Russia in the Eastern Hemisphere stood powerful and defiant against the yellow menace that rolled over Northern Asia. I could rock a white beard. That is entirely possible. I'm going to historical terms again. Just because of the language that we're getting in this story. <clears throat> the postscript, the prescriptive United States operating under dictatorship with industrial and capitalistic socialism, wealthier and stronger than ever before with the unfit, retired, 
the insane uh, eliminated by the uh, wow okay i need to start this sentence over because i didn't know where it was going and wow uh, <clears throat> the prescripted united states operating under dictatorship with industrial and capitalistic socialism wealthier and stronger than ever before with the unfit retired the insane eliminated by euthanasia and the criminals sterilized surged on to dominance of the western world economic rivalry in the new market of africa created estrangement between england and the united states the ugly undercurrents of competition and diplomatic folly were repeating themselves as in the world war yes at this point there would have only been one world war i mean you could go full wizard you do project your visage worldwide <laughs> to bring us the ancient knowledge Ooh, a long white beard. I pr I have I have the hat to go with the long white beard, Iron Trout. It's just at home. But I do have it. Um Yeah, when I had a beard before, it was very red. So when it started when I started sort of growing it out again, um, a few years back, and it was coming in white, I was somewhat saddened because it was very red before. Um, <clears throat> anyway. Uh, Russia and the United States against Japan and England seem to be the coming lineup of titans. With the rest of the world involved in a holocaust that would undoubtedly mark the end of civilization. Wow. Wow. Okay, so 1934, it's interesting to me that he doesn't mention Germany at all, um, or Italy. He says Russia and the U.S. <clears throat> versus Japan and England. <clears throat> and I'm not certain when the initial, like, rise of... The National Socialists in Germany started, I think it, I'm trying to remember, because I did look at that stuff a couple of years back for an exhibit. I want to say it started really showing up in national publications like Life and Time as early as 1935. He came in 33. Okay, so, you see, I didn't remember. And yeah, okay, so he would have been there by now. Um, the alliance of, like, the, the putting the U.S. with Japan. No. Okay, so Russia and the U.S. Russia was allied with the Allies in World War II. Japan with England. So Japan was allied with the Allies in World War One. They were on one of the Axis powers in World War II, but in World War I, Japan was aligned with England and the U.S. and Russia. Um, so having Japan and England paired together makes sense based on the history hearkening back to World War I. That was all where my brain was going with that, was trying to look at the analysis of he paired Russia and U.S. Makes sense, they ended up together uh, in the war to come that he didn't know for certain was on its way that soon. Um, <clears throat> but having Japan and England together uh, also made sense because they were allies in, in the First World War. <clears throat> and then just the mention of a Holocaust. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, so Japan, uh, basically the, the Axis and the Allies, the, the way that they fell out, who was aligned with who, all of that really had to do with uh, international treaties where country B had a commitment to support country A if they went to war. And that's what, like, lumped everybody into wars together. So Japan and Italy and Germany had 
treaties that said, if you go to war, we go with you. Um, I mean, there were a lot of issues with Japan uh, and its imperialistic um, movement into, uh, into China. Um, but all of that started in World War I. So, I mean, it had been going on for a while by the time World War II came. And I don't know, I don't know everything. Like, I know a little bit here and there about um, World War I, World War II, and the interregnum between them. Uh, but you're old and it's been 20 years since you read anything on it. I, the only reason in, as much comes to my brain as it as does is because um, like a, a month ago, we put up an exhibit of propaganda posters, a lot of which came from World War II, um, some of which came from World War I, some of them from the American Civil War, but uh, an exhibit of propaganda posters. And um, some of those posters were um, Japanese or Chinese in origin and in um, identifying them and translating them uh, I had to look at some of that history. So it it's, I glanced at it, uh, but not to read in depth, just to get enough information to be able to identif identify the posters um, like a month ago. That's the only reason I, I know so much of it because I'm definitely not a historian. Um, <clears throat> at least without a lot of prep time. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to keep reading. Uh, Duane looked at the news sheet. Japan creates secondary militia of women. British claim new germ that kills millions, ran the headlines. The world goes mad, he mused. I only hope that all this slaughter will be over by the time I return. For the remodeling of the White Bird went on swiftly. Adjustments of the delicate power controls to give the ship greater drive, corrections in its sensitive hull, so that it might make the utmost of cosmic rays, gravity attra attractions, and atomic repulsions, correction of instruments to accuracy. These were changes that must be made before the white bird, bird, pardon me, before the white bird could start upon that tremendous voyage to the end of the universe. The work ran on and the world raced ahead to disaster. The looming clouds of war grew blacker, and Duane fretted. What did the bickerings of mankind matter when so vast a project neared fruition? October 19th, mist opened the day at Havenside. By noon, a fine rain was falling and the skies were solid gray. Duane roved restlessly around. Tonight was the night of launching, the White Bird would set out to the ends of the universe in an effort to solve one of the greatest riddles that confronted man, the mystery of space. Twelve o'clock brought an ominous note. Duane, as always, when he felt nervous, sat down at his light piano and rippled off phrases of his favorites, a Bach fugue, the frantic monotone of Ravel's Bolero, uh, Lucona's wild... Melochenia. A few bars from the Pure Gint Suite of Gree. I know three of those. The one that I was stumbling on pronouncing, I have not previously heard of, so I did my best. And while he played, upon a panel in front of him, wizardry of supersonics transformed sound to light and color that wove a visible symphony symphony wayne had reached an impressive passage from the hall of the mountain king when the televisor broke forth count katsu irohibi Minister of War for Japan announced at 11.55 a.m. today that Japan was prepared to drop bombs of a new nature upon any part of the world by remote control, unless Russian aggression in Central Asia ceased immediately, and unless the United States and England permitted her to compete with them in the development of Africa. <clears throat> 
Malahuena came out in 1933. Awesome. I, I'm just going to look it up to see, am I pronouncing it anywhere near correctly? Uh... Uh, song, the sixth movement of the Sweet Andalusia. Uh, oh, the Sweet Andalusia by Ernesto Lucona, Cuban composer. Um, does it give me a pronunciation? It does not. Nowhere in here does it give me. Oh no, uh, it does. It's just that it's in IPA only, and I don't really no IPA, International Phonetic Alphabet. Whatever. <laughs> Ernesto Lucona was a Cuban composer. The end of stream is nigh. It's 4.26 p.m. Thank you, Hannah. Um, <clears throat> okay. Should focus, focus. Duane felt a growing tightness. He anxiously wanted to fly immediately to Everest and bring Anne back, but she would not be ready until two, by which time Professor Dowell and she would have analyzed the previous night's photographs, their final effort to riddle the stars and uncover the secret of, of perplexing vacua beyond the 31st magnitude nebulae. He rambled through sonatas and fugues, fragments of symphonies. The drizzle turned to a sodden downpour and the oaks and poplars shook with sodden groans. About 12.30, the televisor erupted, Russia replied to Japan's ultimatum at 12.25 p.m. to the effect that she was not the aggressor and that her territorial rights would be fully protected in Central Asia. The British and American governments simultaneously issued a redeclaration of African policy denying the right of interference to any third party. Russia's defenses and offenses are already fully mobilized, as are Japan's. According to unconfirmed report, England is expected to issue a proclamation of national peril at any moment. John L. Caverhill, Director of America, or Dictator of America, will declare our position shortly, according to reports from Washington. The situation has grown tense. Analysts fear a recurrence of the world war upon a more serious scale. Every effort is being made to avoid armed conflict, but the voice droned on. Prophetic clouds of war. Events were moving far too swiftly in the world of delicate economic adjustments. Duane turned away from the speaker's image and strode toward his stratoplane. Rain beat upon him and ran in rapid trickles down the slicker he had donned. A sullen, heavy, steady rain splashing from skies of slate. Nations plunged toward disaster. Darker than any clouds loomed the threat of war. Mass murder might come by nightfall, and his dream would be ended. Duane had no illusions. If war came, he knew that he would plunge blindly in at the draft, like millions of other pawns in the game of economic kings. He would serve for loyalty, patriotism, many reasons, but he would serve unwillingly because a greater goal lay at stake. <clears throat> He climbed in his stratoplane, headed toward Tibet. Anne should be ready by the hour of his arrival. The voyage through infinity would begin at sunset, unless war intervened. Skies, blue steel, overhung Everest. The quarrels of nations seemed something alien and apart from this austere summit of Earth. The skyward pointing finger of, finger of the observatory rose like a timeless tower, a thing of perpetual beauty a challenge above the assaults of weather and war, age and decay. But the televisor gave pictures and words of ugly meaning. War Minister Irohibi issued a proclamation at 1.10, interning all Russian ships lying in Japanese ports. The order will remain in effect until Russia makes a satisfactory ex explanation and settlement for the mysterious explosion that wrecked the Japanese embassy in Stalingrad yesterday. It is reported that a great concentration of all Russians It is reported that a great concentration of all Russian aircraft is now taking place outside of Stalingrad. Simultaneously, a second note was received at Washington demanding unrestricted colonization privileges for Japanese in the recently formed Anglo-American territory of Tunisia in Southeast Africa. 
The State Department has made no official reply as yet, but a bulletin issued at noon today announced the perfection of a new instrument of war. Short waves are sent by remote control to cause the collapse by vibration of buildings at any given spot. The situation is critical. Mobilization may be ordered by nightfall. <clears throat> Suppressing the anxiety and weariness he felt over this danger that loomed, Duane landed his ship and walked into the observatory. Professor Dowell was striding back and forth irritably, his sandy mustache bristling. War, war, he choked. They want me to work out formulae for the flight of projectiles. They want me to tell them just how to shoot at a point a thousand miles off and kill everyone within a mile radius. Me, and there's work to be done on those. He waved thin fingers toward the sky whose stars were hidden by day. I know. I'm worried, too. It looks like the end. The astronomer raved. They want me to store munitions here. Make this a mere depot. This, the finest observatory ever built. Duane tried to soothe him. War has not been declared yet. Everyone knows that it will be the end if it comes. It will be the last war and maybe the last of civilization. But where's Anna? Um, Hannah, I think you are correct. I think shortwave vibration is a thing that we are actually still looking at. Um, let's see. Shortwave Diathermy? Oh, no, that's that's a therapy. Shortwave radio. Strong vibration. Yeah, I'm not certain. I know I've encountered the concept before of being able to, like, use shortwave or uh, use wave vibrations of some sort to cause ground tremors, but I don't, I don't know details. <clears throat> if you find it, please share. Um, but where's Anna? I took out the license this morning. We're to be married at three, and I've advanced the takeoff to 310. The professor bristled in one of those swift changes of mood that make the individual both fantastic and human. Running away, eh? On the eve of battle, as the historians would say. No, Duane replied steadily. I've got a goal, a tremendous goal, something that may enrich man's life more than the last 2,000 years. I have a mission. If I fail, what is one life lost? If I succeed, the rewards will be beyond guessing. If I stay here, what? Whether I am killed or not, nothing is gained. Therefore, I go. If that is cowardice, then I am glad to be a coward. If war is declared, I will serve. Frankly, I am trying to get started before war begins. Dowell stalked around. Madness. All is madness. Let war come. Science must push on. There may never be another opportunity to find out what lies at the end of the universe. Electrons and atoms. Giant atom universes in a vaster molecule. He paused and stared owlishly a long minute through thick glasses at Duane. Go away, he commanded. I'm upset. I do not know what I say. Find Anne and take her with you. My blessings upon you both. He snorted and trod about in nervous circles, weighing. Who knows what? Duane turned away from the spectacle of a fine mind sent askew by the forces of disaster. Anne was laboring over photographs. She glanced up as he entered her workroom. Hello. She greeted him. I'm fine, thanks, even if you didn't ask. Now, Anne, I know the rest. These photographs are more important. Nothing beyond 31. Listen, lady. And what's more, Anne never finished the sentence. She suddenly found herself picked up and carried out. She did not seem to mind. Hello, exclaimed Professor Dowell, surprised. And goodbye. See you when I return, Duane called. Good luck. Duane deposited Anne in the cockpit beside him and headed homeward. She leaned back, stretched in a most unfeminine but natural fashion. 
So we get married today, she remarked casually. So it would seem, but don't let that bother you. You'll get over it and... The televisor cut in. The closest you can find is sonic weapons. So far, nothing about shortwave signals. Emergency announcement. Japan declared war against Russia at 2-5 today. The Bank of England has just issued a call for the loan of £1 billion by popular subscription. The Department of War of the United States has evoked the compulsory clause of the War Code of 1943. All males registered as voters are required to report at their district military station before sundown. Duane stepped up the speed of his stratoplane to the limit. That means... what? Anne queried. The end, replied Duane grimly, unless we leave sooner. The stratoplane bored westward, high above the Atlantic. New York City curved into view, a vague blur, looking like some fantastic toy with its towers and megaliths, its set uh, setbacks and hanging gardens, and sky palaces showing as a sodden blur through the rain that still fell. Duane headed north of the city and landed at Havenside. Standing beside the hangar that housed the white bird, with rain pouring down his face and oilskins, he smiled at his bride-to-be. Casual, though they had been thus far, he felt the stir of vast, sinister forces that menaced life and felt, too, a surge of emotion that was novel. Um, let me see. Okay, we are not going to finish this story um, on stream. So, um, <clears throat> as I noted at the beginning, there is a compilation of stories that was published in the 80s uh, titled Colossus um, that it, I presume, actually includes this. I, I didn't actually look to see. Um, I will find out really quickly here. Uh, if anybody wants to continue uh, this story and learn more about it, it is um, the author is Donald Wandre, W-A-N-D-R-E-I. Um, and uh, when I post the um, the VOD of this, I will include a link to um, the World Cat Library catalog uh, where you can find the rest of the story. Um, come on. <laughs> I'm just trying to val verify that the two parts of this story are actually uh, in the thing, but I'm not. Ooh, try under directed energy. That's a good idea. Um, Colossus, the collected science fiction of Donald Wandre, was published in 1989. And... Does it tell me what is in... Aha! Yes, it does. It does include both Colossus and Colossus Eternal. Um, this novelette and the, the sequel novella are both in... Uh, Colossus, the collected science fiction of Donald Wandering. I enjoy his writing style. Um, yeah, it's outdated. He was writing in the 1930s, so I'm not surprised by that. Um, but his phrasing and the structure of his sentences is really easy for me, um, and I, I quite enjoy it. Uh, I'm curious what happens with this story. I'm not going to spoil it by, like... Um, <clears throat> jumping ahead to find out, I will just show you the, the pictures that we see. So, they do head into space, we know that much. On, on toward the spiral nebulae, and beyond, into the infinite. Um, I don't know if there's any other illustrations, but yeah, we have, there are so many more pages in this, there's, there, I, there's no way I finish it on stream. Um, because it is, it is lengthy. Oh, no, that. I don't see any other illustrations. 
because the next one is for the next story. Anyway, um, that was number two of the stories that Sam Moskowitz deemed classics only six years after they had been published. And honestly, reading it, I'm not surprised that he did so. I definitely see some classic uh, speculative fiction elements in the story. Um, it, it definitely feels like it was used as inspiration for later things in, in speculative fiction. Um, so yeah, I would agree. I think he, he spotted right away that this one was really um, like a pillar of good speculative fiction, good sci-fi, um, and that it would stand the test of time. And I think it does, uh, generally speaking. Yeah, it's got some outdated stuff to it. Anything written in the past does. Um, but in general, as a science fiction tale, the concepts are solid. And um, the idea behind it, uh, <clears throat> what was the, the phrasing? Thought variant, uh, where F. Orland Tremaine had asked people for original ideas that weren't just taking an adventure story and resetting it into space. Um, I think this hit the bill. This was the first of those that was published, uh, the first of the ones in response to the call that was published, and um, just presenting the idea of maybe our entire galaxy, our entire universe, is just a particle that makes up an atom that is part of a much larger universe. Um, I don't know if that's what they find, but just as an idea, that is definitely novel. That was something that certainly was not uh, common at the time this story was published. So, dramatic without being melodramatic. That's a good way to say it, Keyspeard. Nice contrast with his friend Lovecraft. Um, <clears throat> okay, I do need to be but winding down, that's not what I wanted. I wanted here, um, because if I can, I'm going to try and pop on over um, to the building next door and show my face uh, for the um, launch party for the Pride Center's new library that they have. Um, and that's happening right now. So, um, but if anybody is in town and wants to stop by there, uh, it is at Squires, uh, at the, the Pride Center, from 4 to 6 tonight. So, um, let's see. Uh, coming up next week on Arkable Adventures, it will be the first Wednesday in October, which should be the Pelts Journal, but that is still away being um, at, away at the Conservators. Uh, having some repair work done to it, and it definitely deserves it. We'll get back to that whenever it returns from the conservator. So instead, next week, we are looking at uh, the Union Electricitats Gesellschaft. Uh, essentially, it's photographs. It's a it's a photograph book, uh, UEG, and so we'll look a little at the history of the company. Um, it's early electricity stuff, uh, late 19th century electricity, um, specifically in Germany, but yeah, the photos aren't labeled, so it'll be interesting to try and understand what we're seeing, looking at the electric technology of the day. Um, there will probably be some internet searching to try and, um, understand the machines and their mechanics and their place in history. Um, but the photos themselves are amazing. And I'm looking forward to looking through the book. So um, hopefully I will have some of you joining me for that next week. Uh, for now, though, we are going to raid. And um, <clears throat> because he has an amazing community and uh, is currently playing a game 
called Space Trucker. Um, we're going to pop on over and say hi to Stephen Joyce and continue the space theme. Um, also, I just like rating Stephen Joyce because Stephen has an amazing community. Um, and if, oh, Star Trucker, sorry. And if, if you uh, want to see a lovely tiny hat added to Stephen's head, all you have to do is ask. Stephen has many tiny hats and we'll put them on for you upon request. <laughs> uh, so thank you all so much for joining me. I hope that I will see all of you again in the near future. Um, until I do, get out there and keep exploring history, everyone. Thank you.